Okay, Ed, very good. This is what I like to consider a optical equivalent of a Yagi. You have the driven element, which is the light bulb. You have a mirror behind it, and you have a lens in front of it. So this is the optical equivalent of a Yagi. Has fun doing this through that. So the driven element excites the, uh, the Yagi itself. Here we have three versions. Up at the top, you see that the driven element is longer than the other ones. So that means some of the energy leaks around the back of the antenna, and this has a poor front to back. Down at the bottom, you see that we have a driven element, which is too short, and therefore the energy doesn't get past the first director. In the middle, you have the one that's just right. And I say this only because I have heard other people say it. If you built these three, test them on the antenna range, performance would be identical. The driven element is exciting the rest of the Yagi structure. How long it is, it doesn't make any difference. So adjust the length or whatever you need to get a good, uh, good SWR, good impedance match, and that's fine. Here we'll start with the basic driven element. Impedance, 70, 72, 75. Some people want to argue any differences. Uh, the diameter of the element makes a bit of a difference, but we'll say, you know, 72 ohms. Here we have one where I actually have two dipoles in here. One, this one's tuned to 902. This one's tuned to 1296. And I have uh, two reflectors in back. So now we have a dual band, two element Yagi that I used as a dish feed. Very simplistic. And the distance between here and here loads this element down. So if you bring these to just the right distance, you load the 72 down to 50 ohms. So you can get a 50 ohm impedance match just by the spacing of the other elements. Here's where we take it to a somewhat more exaggerated condition. And we actually end up with a multiband Yagi. This one was used to listen to transmitters in the stomachs of cows. <laughs> Uh, another long story in itself. Uh, the short elements are tuned to 434 megs. The longer elements are tuned to 315. So this used two ISM bands to listen to cow stomachs. Here we have what's known as the beta match, where we have a short little stub on the back. And this short stub behaves like a capacitor. So this is almost like a capacitor across here, which you're using for impedance matching. Come on. OK, here we have a beta match on a commercial Yagi. If you've ever been to uh, Friedrichshaven in Germany for their version of Dayton, uh, that's the ceiling there at Friedrichshaven. But you now see that we have a stub here. And the length of the stub determines the value of what's effectively a capacitor. And this is a very common way to get uh, impedance matching on your driven element. Here we have what's called the folded dipole. Impedance is somewhere between two and 300 ohms, depending on uh, how wide the spacing is and how wide the uh, diameter of the element is, but another common driven element. Here we have one which actually built into the Yagi. Being nice and broad, that brings it a little bit lower in impedance. And now by controlling the distance between the other elements, I can again load this down to 50 ohms just by the spacing of the elements. The little rubber tips really mess up most antennas. That's not recommended. You'd be amazed how far that shifts the frequency, but uh, they look pretty. So now we'll take a look at a Yagi. I have them spread out. And I can get a 72 ohm match. Take I can take a 72 ohm driven element and load it down to 50. On the bottom, I've got a much higher impedance driven element, and now I have to bring the elements in closer to load it down to 50 ohms. These are both valid techniques. The only difference is the bottom one. These elements get pretty critical on their distance, but these are both valid. And the gain of a Yagi is determined by the distance between the last element and the first. That's what determines the gain. The driven element, the number of elements, the spacing of the elements uh, make it broadband or impedance matching, but it doesn't change gain very much. That's the total length. 
Here's another technique that you're now seeing a lot on HF, and that's called the offset fed dipole. If I feed it right in the middle, I get 72 ohms. As I start sliding off the edge, the impedance goes up. In theory, if I'm right at the edge, the impedance approaches infinity. So I can find a point where I get 100 ohms, 200 ohms, 300 ohms, whatever I want. And here's an example of an antenna made to work this way. So we've got a, a sleeve vertical. They're calling it a dipole. It's really more of a ground plane to vertical. And you can see they pick a feed spot that's up in the middle of it in order to get the impedance they want. Totally valid way of doing it. Here's a Yagi where they're doing it inside the Yagi. So we're feeding it inside here. And again, working to get the impedance that they want. Works fine. Here's a Cushcraft antenna. They're doing the same thing inside here. Uh, years ago, Cushcraft used to make some of the world's finest air-cooled dummy loads. They've gotten a lot better in recent years. Here we have a uh, schematic representation of what's called a gamma match. You come in, you have an inductor, a capacitor, and you tune it. This can create a few issues. Here we have a gamma match on a, whoops, back up one. All I have to do is think about moving. So now we have one rod inside here, and that's forming your capacitor. And then this area, you can move it in and out until you get things tuned. Very commonly done. There's some real problems with a gamma match and why I don't like them. Let's see if I can back up too. Okay, this is effectively forming like an antenna tuner and I can tune a lot of sins away by how I adjust these. Years ago, there was a uh, popular AMSAT antenna that was supposed to be used at 435 megs. It was a 465 meg Yagi. So I take a 465 meg Yagi and with the uh, matching circuit here, I give it a good SWR at 435. Just because you have a good SWR does not mean you have a good antenna. So they were, uh, the, they never performed quite as guys hoped they would. Okay, now we have the T match, another common way of doing it. You, you could say you're forming a small folded dipole in the middle. You adjust your stubs in and out until you get a good impedance match. Very commonly done. It's a fine way of doing it. You've got a lot of mechanical connections which can have corrosion over time, but you got to treat those carefully and it works fine. Here we have an example of a T-match. And in this case, he also has added a quarter wave ballon in order to get a better impedance match. And we'll talk about element mounting in a moment. Here's a new one that we're seeing quite often. And this is where they actually run the coax inside the driven element and connect the shield here, the center conductor here. Now the driven element becomes its own ballot, uh, very popular. The headache you have is they usually make this connection by just crimping the aluminum tubing. Sorry for the Brits, aluminum. Now I have a mechanical connection between copper and aluminum. Can anybody spell electrolysis? Uh, so these tend to work uh, okay for a while and then they get intermittent. And if you squeeze this again with a pair of pliers, it'll work a little bit better for a while. Here's an example of a Yagi, which is done that way. And they've put some heat shrink tubing over to try and protect it from the weather. Here's another one uh, made uh, by an American company. And again, they put a little heat shrink over it. And I can tell you right now, that's not enough. It does weather and the driven element appears to go open after a few years. This is one that Personally, I like to use on a lot of my designs. It's called a J, uh, the J-driven element. I like to call it three quarters of a folded dipole. Has about 150 ohm impedance in uh, free space. And that can then be used to load it down to 72 for ATV applications or all the way down to 50. Here's an example of one which is made for UHF television service. You can see they're feeding it the same way here and the uh, elements are pretty widely spaced out. This is one that uh, we're seeing on 2.4 gig, and I would love to see some uh, potential work for some of the hand bands. Here we have stacked Yagis with one driven element. 
So there's an element in here and they couple to the two different elements. So how would you like to stack a couple of Yagi's and not have a power divider? Close up again, there's only one driven element in here. Here's a UHF television antenna for use in Europe. And they'll actually cut the directors for the different parts of the UHF band. This is a pretty broad band reflector and a very broad band driven element back there. Nothing like having different Yagi's uh, all in one boom. Another version of it. This driven element right here is particularly interesting. The guy was hoping that I could come up with some way of duplicating it. Circuit board, virtually all European television antennas have uh, filters in them to keep the cell phone bands out because the cell phone frequencies are right next to television, like we're going to be very shortly. Uh, but the TV stations run a lot less power. So they run a lot more gain in the preamps. Uh, European TV antennas usually do not work in the United States. The preamps just completely overload. So here's a little bit of filtering and a rather interesting ballot <laughs> arrangement that they've got. Okay, we were back to our driven elements again. And uh, here we have a folded dipole and you can see how they make the adjustments on it. This is uh, an antenna from a guy who uh, likes to say his antennas receive signals and do not receive noise. Uh, we've had some rather vigorous discussions at a couple of conferences. Uh, he had at Dayton several years ago, he had this antenna for sale and a plot right next to it. And I looked at the antenna, looked at the plot, and I said, that computer generated plot is not of that antenna. Because you've got this loop, which is radiating, and you have this loop, which is radiating. And he said, well, I don't have to include that in the plot because there's no current in it. If there's no current in it, why do you even have it? There's a version he's got on the two meters with a nice long one. So I was quite uh, happy a few years later when I noticed his design to go to, it changed to more typical ballon arrangements and he no longer uses that stub. Yes, you can go circularly polarized, a mechanical challenge. Your element doesn't have to be a rod. It can be a disc. Uh, these are usually popular if you're trying to generate circular polarization. Although several years ago, we had, he's actually a professional antenna engineer, show up at one of the central states antenna contests with his version. Uh, research is continuing on data versus music DVDs and DVDs versus CDs on the performance. He actually got 10 dB gain out of that. He was a little more clever than you might think. These were ovals and he would rotate them gently and rotating them back and forth was the same as making the elements longer and shorter. So he very quickly adjusted all the elements equivalent length and uh, got 10 and a half dB gain out of this guy. Ah, we're back to the idea of putting multiple elements on the same antenna, which we'll be uh, talking more about at the end. A lot of different ways to attach your elements to the boom. In fact, I had a problem some time ago where uh, we were taking, trying to increase the patch antenna gain, and I was trying to figure out how to put Yagi elements in front of it, and there was no clean way of simulating that. So I ended up making uh, this fixture moving everything around until I got maximum gain out of it. And then we uh, sealed those up the plastic, oh, allowing for the effects of the plastic as well. Log periodics. Uh, I've done about 140 different flavors of log periodics for a variety of applications. I like to think of these as a three element Yagi. The signal comes down the middle, finds the element that resonates, the one behind acts as a reflector, the one in front acts as a director. So it's sort of a sliding three element Yagi. There was a plan uh, some years ago to try and put log periodics as part of a Yagi. In fact, this is a, a picture off of my tower. And the idea was to get more bandwidth out of a Yagi. You can get pretty good bandwidths just by having wide spacing and tapering. This was an interesting idea it really didn't affect the uh, bandwidth of the Yagi. This is my two gig, three gig, five gig, 10 gig dish feed, because there's a little circuit board uh, 
log periodic right there feeding my dish. And uh, this is another topic we'll have in a minute. This is a tail warning radar dish out of a B-29. One trick uh, here, this was a Yagi that was used from 2.4 and 5.8. Well, I, directors would mess this up at the lower frequencies, but I can add directors to a log periodic at the high end. So that you end up after going through all the coax to have about the same amount of signal on 2.4 and 5.8, they added uh, directors for 5.8. One headache you have is how you attach elements to the boom. If you think of the element as a linear inductor, the fat area changes that inductance. So if I've got about an inch of fat stuff in the thin stuff, I now have to make the element about an inch longer to compensate for the boom. If I just poke it through here, this works fine for a few months, and then you start getting corrosion where the element and the boom match. Now suddenly the element appears to be on a much lower frequency. So on a lot of the antennas that aren't made very well, you start out as a 450 antenna. After a month, it's 440, 430, 400 and it drifts lower in frequency. Although this one's done some spot welding, so I don't think that's going to be an issue. Uh, here's one. Look at uh, how we have our treatment where the element and the boom come together and our lovely uh, fastening element. Anybody care to guess on how frequency stable this guy's gonna be with time? And if you think that's bad, how about one that's just got two dents in it to hold the driven element, hold the elements? Uh, good luck. So there's a lot of different ways of attaching the element and each one of those affects the length of the element whether i'm square round or insulated all affect the final length of the element this has become a rather popular way you insulate it you have some keepers and now the effects of the boom are greatly reduced and the element is isolated from the boom so you don't have to worry about corrosion changing things very much but I've seen some detailed numbers for this, and the answer is you can't do that. How big this hole is around the element, what the dielectric constant of the plastic is, how big the keepers are, ratios between the diameters of these two, all affect the effects of the boom. And you really can't predict it. Some guys have tried computer models without much luck. Gunther, a DL6WU who did a lot of Yagi designs, says really there's only one way to do this. Build you a three element Yagi and very carefully adjust it so you got a real nice low SWR and then replace the director with your test product and then adjust its length until it appears to be the same as the one you had before. Now you know exactly what your compensation factor is you have to measure it. Guessing is uh, good luck. Anybody care to guess what the boom correction factor is on this one? Um, so, so Kent? Yes. Yeah, Gordon Beatty, W2TTT. So I've admired your work for years. So you went on the, uh, on the through the boom insulated, you know, kick just a minute ago on last slide or two. And so that brings up my question, which do you like or dislike better and for which reason? The Cushcraft, which you which you clearly have issues with, I can understand. 13... Uh, they, 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 they've gotten better in the recent years, back in the 60s. Ugh. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, believe me, I, I, I've had my share. I, I feel the pain. Anyway, a 13B2 versus the directive systems. Now we're into the through the boom with the insulator and the keepers dance, uh, 10 elements. So I have several of each, and I'm just curious your impressions of each. And, it, you know, because a, a centering around the topics that you had here with insulating and feeding and all this stuff. So could you kind of roll that back into, you know, into uh, those two models? Because I think people have things that are like that. All of those work and work fine if they're designed if the links are designed into the final antenna there's nothing wrong with doing either one of the ways you just can't take it the headache you get is if somebody takes a design 
tries to copy it, but then wants to use different diameter elements, different materials, different keepers. Do that with care. Yeah, well, okay. But I'm, I'm just kind of curious if, if, no, one if, is if you have one a is preference. A, uh, well, you'll see most of mine, I use a piece of wood. That completely eliminates the issue. Yeah, I, well, God bless you. I mean, I, I, I live in Florida, and humidity is an issue. I mean, good God. It's called Thompson's Water Seal. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, mo most of mine do have insulated elements. That uh, is the way that I've got for the aluminum ones. But I've had some of these have been in the air for 10 years now. But one trick that I'll do is I, I have an antenna range, so I have the ability to actually test these. You can see I've got a little piece of wood with a piece of element material on it. And I'll set this up and start testing it. And I'll just get this near the tips of the elements. And very quickly, I can see if I start getting it near the element and gain goes up, then that element was too short. If as soon as I get near it, gain goes down, that element's too long. And in a, just you know less than a minute, I can go through an 11 element Yagi and make notes as all the elements that need to be changed. Okay, then you bring up my other, my second question. <laughs> Uh, and is you have an antenna test range. I mean, I'm blessed with what would you put if you had to if you had the opportunity to put something permanent on that acreage, what would you put on each end as a signal source? And then what do you do to measure device under test, if you will? Okay, I use the classic thousand hertz AM method. I have a signal generator that tunes the frequency I want with thousand hertz AM. Then I have a, a diode detector on the receive antenna. And I go to an HP 415, which is uh, goes down to half a microvolt sensitivity, shows everything in uh, fractions of a dB. And you can easily see the difference between a reference antenna and the other one, and you just tune it for best smoke. Sweet. Thank you. Okay. Now, I was speaking with an East German antenna engineer, Y23RD, who had done a lot of Yagi work. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, you get a tightly tuned Yagi and you can take the reflector off. It doesn't make any difference. I go, what? If you go through, especially like uh, in, in England, the RSGB uh, antenna books and so forth, you find that a driven element and a director has more gain and better front to back than a driven element and a reflector. It's actually smaller as well, which is why when you got a little garden in England, they uh, need all the small they can. So I actually uh, spent some time designing this. The computer predicted 40 dB front to back ratio. It demonstrated 27 dB front to back ratio, and there's no reflector. Of course, I had to make a few compensation uh, because I was using my, uh, favorite driven element here. Now, I will say this, it gave me the gain, it gave me the front to back, but the bandwidth was very narrow. A reflector makes the bandwidth a lot better, but you don't have to have it. Now, this is something that we're seeing in a lot of tests, especially doing RFID antennas. And this is Yagi's with very, very fat elements. And we're playing with 900 meg Yagi's that have 50 megahertz, almost no SWR, and none of the computer programs predict it. The computer programs take the element and make them infinitesimally small, and then based on the diameter, adjust their effective length. But there are effects that happen in the real world that the computer programs are not modeling. And for you guys who like HFSS, I can give you three families of antennas HFSS cannot model. Well, it models. It gives you an answer to 12 decimal places, and it's nothing compared to what you see on the network analyzer and the antenna range. Now, here's something that I would love to find out where it came from. It's the idea that if I'm stacking two antennas, and these are done in relative capture areas, that I should adjust them so that the capture areas almost but not quite touch. Several guys have published this. I've been chasing them around for a couple of years, and I still don't know who is guilty of this. This is, use your favorite four-letter adjective. You cannot mix capture areas of different frequencies at the same time. So we decided to actually measure this. I know it's a bizarre concept. Opinions should be worth more than data. So at one of the antenna contests at Central States, 
We took three Aggies. These were our reference antennas we used for the testing. And we tested them on all three bands. So the two meter antenna had seven square meters of capture area on two meters, 0 0.003 on 220, and 0.016 on 432. And as you can see, that's a trend. So if we're going to go back to those capture area diagrams, we should have ones that look like this. Um, I, where this all came from. Now, if we do want to actually say this is correct, you cannot have multiple antennas using the same capture area. How many of you have DXCC using a good old Mosey tri-bander antenna where you got 20, 15, and 10 meters on the same antenna? Whoever came up with this says you can't do that. So I guess you need to give back your DXCC. But if anybody knows who came up with that original concept, please let me know. So next thing we wanted to do was actually measure this. Again, we're back to various opinions. So I took a 900 mag Yagi and a 440 Yagi and started doing pattern measurements, getting them closer and closer. The unused Yagi got a 50 ohm termination during measurements. And I kept getting closer until I got them as close as I could without redoing the mounts, showing the 50 ohm load. So here's what we get. Here's the uh, 900 mag antenna. The red is when the antenna was by itself. The blue is when it had the 432 antenna virtually touching it. Not a lot of change. And here's what the 432 Yagi looked like. The red is when it was by itself. The blue was when the 902 was virtually touching it. So the answer is you can get your antennas very, very close together without changing the patterns. Or how about some of the new five band HF uh, Yagis? Uh, before I go on to the next topic, uh, questions, comments, snide remarks, insults? Yeah, I got one, Kent, uh, Gordon Beatty again. So you, th those were harmonically related, the two examples you have. So although your data showed that you had 220 in the mix, but you didn't test that. So I'm just kind of curious as to- I Well, I was limited to what I could- on doesn't make much difference. So, so, so I'm blessed with a, a few chunks of inch and five eighths heliacs and some really low loss flexible coax. So are we saying that if I wanted to do a single Yagi solution up on top of my tower, I should consider crunching, you know, passively a couple of extra Yagis next to my 432 Yagi or next to my 220 Yagi? They won't affect each other very much. And the thing to be concerned with now is if I'm running high power I've, on two meters, I've got a 432 driven element that's only a couple of feet away. Will I get enough energy into that to blow out a preamp? So you got to look for coupling effects hurting each other. And you're looking at the only guy in town who has a two meter suck out trap on his 2304 station, because every time I pointed the two meter EME station at it, I blew out the 2304 preamp. Yeah, I've been there too, I understand. Okay. Okay. Thank you. W2JC, Chris. Yes. Uh, could you go over what the definition of the capture area that you're using as a... Uh, there's, a for, there's a formula where you take gain in DBI and wavelengths, and it converts it into an equivalent area. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we're going to uh, change uh, things just a little bit. Oh, I've been known to work on antennas of all sizes. The I'm six foot even and little guy. The big guy is the director of engineering for the Daystar network. Um, he physically couldn't get to parts of the tower to make some measurements. And uh, that's the elevator we used. And we had a paper airplane contest at the 1500 foot level. You see a little fuzz in the picture. Those aren't compression artifacts. Those are, uh, well, there was eight TV stations and 11 FM stations just above me. I guess I'm lucky I didn't fry the camera. He later let me use one of their Channel 2 antennas during a VHF contest. Okay, now the ones that uh, this was done for the Brits, but it still has an ending that you guys will enjoy. This is a B-29. B-17 can't carry it. B-24 can't carry it. A B-29 cannot carry it. The B-29 was designed to carry a whole bunch of little bombs. They had a bomb bay in front of the wing, a bomb bay behind the wing, and the wing spar ran between the two. You couldn't uh, enlarge it. However, the Brits had these Lancasters, and the Lancasters had a really large area for the bombs, 
and they were dropping these uh, 18,000 pound tall boys on the U-poke pins. And we go, well, okay, these guys can do it. So without knowing what they were doing, the Brits set aside six Lancaster bombers for dropping the atomic bombs on Japan. This is the Edistone field, which is one they trained out of. The headache was the Lancaster did not have the range to get to Japan and back. So they modified three of them into tankers, would drop out a long hose, the tail gunner of the other plane would reach up and grab the hose, connect it up, and that's how they did mid-air refueling. Well, we decided that wasn't going to work very good. So General uh, Groves had Boeing build 15 planes with a completely different wing spar configuration. So the atomic bombers had a completely different wing spar and now had room to put it in. The headache was in the practice uh, sessions, these bombs had a habit of leaving when they weren't supposed to and bent up an awful lot of sheet metal on the bomb bay doors. Well, the Brits have got it worked out. They're dropping 18,000 pound ones. So they went over to England, got a group of type G bomb shackles, and we used the British shackles to release the atomic bombs. This was probably all for the best. It would have been somewhat interesting when they were first doing this. We really didn't know how big the bang was going to be. The Lancaster flew about 10, 15,000 feet lower than the B-29 and flew about 100 miles an hour slower. So that means when it released the bomb, it's going to get to its explosion point a lot faster because we're three miles lower. And then when we turn and make a run for it, we're 100 miles an hour slower. We know that the Enola Gay was 11 miles from the bomb when it went off. The Lancaster would have been about six. I think the crew had a sporting chance at survival, but I wouldn't have wanted to be the tail gunner. Then the, the one little bit of irony that I've always enjoyed was to make sure the bomb exploded at the right height. We had a 400 meg height finding radar. And I always enjoyed the irony that we returned the Yagi antenna to Japan. Snide remarks, insults. <laughs> KD2KLN. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, uh, Yagi's I have seen, uh, particularly on uh, two meter, uh, where uh, the directors are not evenly spaced, but rather as you go further out on the boom, uh, they get wider and wider apart. And I'd like to know why that is done and what the advantage is, if any. Uh, they do not have to be uh, evenly spaced. In fact, they usually end up not being evenly spaced. When they were making the early designs, when I would set up a Yagi and I'd put all the elements at 0.1 wavelengths, 0.2 wavelengths, 0.3 wavelengths, that was easier to play with. But what you actually want is the current in each element to be slightly less. You want a nice even taper of the current. So I can either make the elements shorter or change the element to element spacing. Both of those will decrease the current and that will give you the cleanest pattern. Kent, this is Ed, WX2R. I have a question from uh, Zudipta, okay, who is in, in India, Victor Uniform 2 Delta Tango. And he's asking your opinion of the ZL special Yagi antenna. Uh, the ones out of New Zealand? I believe so. Um, most of the modern Yagis today are pretty well built. I don't know of any that are uh, what I would call pieces of junk compared to some of the ones. Years ago, there was a modification where you took the Kushcraft 11 element Yagi, converted it to a seven element Yagi, and picked up a DB and a half more gain. Ken, are you referring to the old, the, the old uh, fishbone, evenly spaced uh, Yagi that they made for? for two meters and other bands? Correct. Yeah, what a piece of junk that was. You forgot to mention the, the gamma RF absorption device, otherwise known as a feed. Well, I did mention gamma matches and how they can fool you because they can give you a good SWR, but not necessarily a good antenna. Yeah, well, particular gamma match had a little tiny ceramic capacitor potted inside of a piece of, a piece of some sort of, of clear plastic. And when you broke it, you thank God after you stopped cursing that your antenna didn't work because once you repaired it with something else like a, a piece of coax, it 
performed magically better than the original antenna, and that was still with a gamma match. <laughs> I have a question, Ken. Certainly. This is Steve, WI2W. First of all, I've built a whole bunch of your uh, cheap Yagis and really enjoy them. Thank you very much for that uh, inexpensive and well-performing design. My question is on a log periodic and sweeping a dual band log periodic where you sweep the elements forward supposedly to improve the pattern. Can you comment on that? Okay. That's where me and the owner of elk antennas uh, depart rather quickly. Log periodics, the elements do not work on their harmonics. The exception is when you sweep them forward at about a 30 degree angle. On television channels, channels seven through 13 are the third harmonic of channels two through six. So if I make a channel two to channel six log periodic and then sweep the elements forward 30 degrees, it works on its uh, third harmonic. Elk is selling a log periodic to uh, AMSAT guys that is quote two meters and 435. If you want to know how well it might works, point its ass at the satellite and the 435 signal will be much stronger. Yeah. Hey, Ken. Can yes. You talk about the uh, relationship between uh, SWR and, uh, well, what you measure is uh, complex impedance. Well, you want your complex impedance to look like 52 ohms, in which case your SWR is one. <laughs> yeah, but that could be from inductance or capacitance, and it wouldn't be resistive. And uh, uh, none of them. If your antenna is fifty ohm resistive, you're, what are you using? A bunch of fifty ohm resistors as your driven element? <laughs> Light bulbs. <laughs> uh, how could I model different element sizes and come up with different bandwidths? Well, uh, LNEC, EasyNEC, and Yagi Max will do that to somewhat of a degree. Especially I, if I'm messing with Yagi's, I personally like to use Yagi Max. And you find that the wider elements do give you a little more bandwidth. Spreading the elements out further apart gives you a little bit more bandwidth. I have gotten Yagi's out to about 30% bandwidth. And that was really pushing it. Hi, uh, this is Jay, NY2NY. Is there a, a, a maximum gain for a single uh, boom Yagi? or uh, theoretically, or can you keep going and add more directives? Uh, my personal record is 80 elements and it demonstrated 22 dB a gain. Okay, that's empirical though. That was measured. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so there, <laughs> if you added another one, you couldn't measure the difference in gain? In the, if, we, if I had gone from uh, 80 elements to 160, I theoretically would have gotten about two dB more gain. Aha. Uh -huh. So there really is, in fact, not necessarily a, a, a limit on the amount of gain you can get out of a single Yagi, as long as you want to make it long enough. That is correct. Uh, and interestingly, there's we now start getting into some optics. And there's some suggestions that if you put a slow wave structure into it, in other words, instead of continuously tapering elements, you have the elements go through a slow sine wave change in links that that helps when you're trying to go after a couple of hundred elements, but it gets an awful lot easier to just stack them. <laughs> <laughs> At some point. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, you too, Kaylin again. Uh, hi. Um, I remember hearing there was like a rule that uh, each of your elements has to be 5% smaller than the previous so I'm wondering, is that some sort of uh, a sweet spot that everyone has found? Because in your early slides of this presentation, it seemed like there was no hard and fast rule to how long or short those elements need to be, as long as the uh, driven element can excite uh, the other elements uh, in front of it. The hard rule, or is it? It's, it is not. It is not. Uh, you want your directors to be about, if I start with a half wave dipole in free space and then start adding elements, then you want the reflector to be about 5% longer. You want the directors to be about 5% smaller, but the directors are all going to be uh, normally changing in length. Those are approximations and really doesn't work beyond a three element Yagi. Okay, thanks. Other questions? I return control of this menagerie to you. 
Thank you, Kent. Okay, and, and thank you all for just a really great night. Kent, a fabulous presentation. I think if we all walked away with something tonight, I think that just made for a great, great program. Anyway, we had about, I think just a quick net, a little over 70 people, okay, for tonight, which is the largest program that we've had this year in terms of attendance. Kent, thank you very, very much on behalf of the club. <laughs>